God's first arrival to earth as a human. And technically, I think we've talked about this before, we can say that arrival took place much earlier than what we celebrate as Christmas Day. The arrival of God on earth in a human body took place first nine months before his actual birth out of that virgin girl named Mary. Nine months earlier is when God fertilized that egg inside of Mary with all of the supernatural genetics that would keep Jesus from compromising every bit of his goodness, any bit of his goodness, and allowed him to retain that all in an actual human body as 100% human. The greatest miracle that God ever did is that conception inside of Mary that took place nine months before what we celebrate as Christmas. So that's, <clears throat> we, we got our um, candles going. They're a reminder to us that we're very close now to uh, <clears throat> the celebration. It'll come this Friday. And so the first of today's Bible sections is the one from the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the Gospel writer that gives us the most complete account of Jesus' birth. <clears throat> and it gives us a ton of background. The Matthew book gives a little bit. Mark gives us nothing. John gives us some stuff that we sometimes look at and are a little confused about. And we'll get to that after Christmas. But this Luke account tells us about a messenger from God, a supernatural being, an alien to this life here, named Gabriel, a real person with a real name. Special being God created at the beginning, sometime in the first six days. This angel announced to Mary that she was the one that all Jewish women aspired to be. The one who would hold inside of her body the body of God himself. And this is what Mary was aware about, these promises from the Old Testament Bible. The woman that she's going to see is Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is also going to talk about Mary's baby the same way as Mary thinks of it. This is a miracle from God that these two women uh, really get it. Again, you see what's going on. God starts first, just like he did at Easter, by teaching women. He taught Mary he taught Elizabeth before he taught Mary. And at Jesus' return to life, you had women being the first ones to see Jesus alive, hear his explanations, and really be able to kick off the celebration. Before that, you had Jesus explaining the Bible to people like Mary and Martha in their home in the suburb of Jerusalem. But this one, this Bible section for today takes us way up to Galilee County, which you can see on the map up by number one. That Galilee in the big print is Galilee County. It's the northernmost county for Jewish people. <clears throat> and, and, and then the city of Nazareth, not because it was bigger or more famous, but because it is the hometown of Mary. And that is where the angel appears to her and tells her, God has selected you. And she says, may it be unto me as God has explained it. In other words, go ahead. God can make this miracle inside me happen. And that's when it happened. The Bible's 
specific about this. It says that this happened in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Elizabeth lives way down where number three is headed, down near Jerusalem, down here by Jerusalem, somewhere here. We don't have a city name for where Elizabeth and her priest husband, Zechariah, lived. Mary goes down there because the angel brought it up, said to Mary, if you have a hard time believing that God could make the miracle of a baby inside you without any male involvement, then go down and see your relative, Elizabeth, because she is a senior citizen and she is carrying a baby inside of her, not because her husband wasn't involved, but because this is a miracle. She had been unable to have children the whole time of her marriage, and now she was passed biologically having a baby, and yet she is pregnant in her old age when she's collecting Social Security. This was a tremendous miracle. This Martha lady, uh, this uh, uh, Elizabeth lady, she wouldn't even go out of her house during her pregnancy because it was so weird to see a senior citizen pregnant. And she didn't want to answer a bunch of questions. So Zechariah, her husband, had to go to all these for her and had to do all the outside stuff because she wasn't going to expose herself to this. Imagine how happy she was when she had someone to talk to, somebody who would know and believe the same thing she did about their miracle babies. Take a look. Luke chapter 1, verse 39. Soon after Gabriel's message, Mary hurried to a city in the hills of Judah County. She went to Zechariah's home and greeted his wife, Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard the greeting, then she felt her baby kick. The Holy Spirit had filled Elizabeth. She shouted. That's the reason she knows that Mary is pregnant, even though no one else would know it. And that's the reason she believes it's God himself inside of Mary in human form. And that's the reason why Elizabeth believes all the stuff about the baby that she is six to seven months carrying inside of her. When Elizabeth heard the greeting, she felt her baby kick. The Holy Spirit had filled Elizabeth. So even the baby depended on the infant inside of Mary. She shouted, God picked you for the greatest privilege any woman ever had. The child inside you is going to be the greatest ever. It is such an honor from God for me to host the mother of God. So here, Elizabeth says something amazing. She calls Mary the mother of God, not because there ever was a time when God didn't exist and Mary had to give birth to God in order for there to be a God, but because God was arriving on earth in this unassuming package, this fragile present uh, unwrap in nine months. Verse 44. As soon as I heard your greeting, Elizabeth said, I felt the baby inside me jump for joy. Yahweh's blessed you with the faith to depend that his guarantee to you will come true. Mary said, I keep telling myself how wonderful Yahweh is. When I think of God, my Savior, I am full of joy. Notice she says, I need a Savior. 
and God is my savior. When I think of God, my savior, I'm full of joy because he has given me his no good slave girl, a great privilege. From now on, people forevermore will talk about the honor God's given me. The ruler of all has given me a great privilege. And that's how he does things, opposite of what we merit. For people who depend on his rescue plan, his mercy is available, no matter when in history those people live. He has regularly done what people think is impossible. See, what Mary said here is in the Bible as God's word, too. So the Holy Spirit has filled not just her relative Elizabeth to speak God's truth, almost like you would say inspiration, but what Mary is saying is also God's truth, too, because she's quoting from a lot of the Old Testament Bible. God has regularly done what people think is impossible. He bowls over people who think too highly of themselves. He pulls famous kings off their thrones. He puts humble people in places of power. He feeds hungry people with good food. He sends rich people away with nothing. So you can't be talking about grocery shopping for wealthy people and people stricken by poverty. He's talking about when people realize they're clueless and hopeless without the gift only God can give. Rich people would be people who feel they're good enough. They've done enough. They're religious. They don't need anything. Then he doesn't give them anything. They don't want what Jesus has to offer. He sends rich people away with nothing. He kept his promise to always help his slave, Israel. This is the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants. And so this song of Mary or this poem of Mary is really amazing. <clears throat> we have it in song in our hymn books because it's saying God's truth and it's reflecting the way that people God brings into his family of believers celebrate this good news. This life is not all there is. God inserted himself into this world as a human being. God inverted himself with us, took our sins, suffered our punishment, and that is the reason why we know the best is yet to come. And so this section from Luke 1 is really amazing. The next chapter is going to be the account of Mary and Joseph and in the days of Caesar Augustus and all that stuff. But this Luke 1, 39 to 55 is no Bible section to turn up our noses at. It's very important to... The uh, second Bible section is one from the Old Testament. And it's from almost the end of our Old Testament Bible. So it's fairly close to the Matthew account where the angel messenger comes to Joseph when he's thinking of getting rid of his fiance, his wife, Mary, who he's legally married to, but just hasn't lived with yet because she's obviously pregnant after she came back. Then the Bible says God sent a messenger to Joseph to clear everything up with him so he could be a, you know, a supporter of the Savior and of his wife because they were going to have to make, before that baby was born, a long trip from Galilee County, but the place where they'd have to go is something the Old Testament Bible told them about long before this. The city, the famous Jewish King David came from originally. I guess we'd probably call it a village back then. Nothing to sneeze at. But the Bible told us five, six hundred years before Jesus' arrival that it would be 
the Jewish village of Bethlehem that would house mankind's creator and judge. Take a look at this. Yahweh says, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are one of the smallest towns in the nation of Judah. Yet from you, I will bring the ruler for Israel. I said he would be a Jewish guy, God saying, and yet he's the ruler of everything and he's gonna come from the city of Bethlehem. He comes from the very distant past so long ago. This is the Bible way of saying he has always existed and he always will because he's not just a human baby with a birthplace, but he's God himself who's always existed. Verse three, I, Yahweh, am going to abandon Israel to its enemies until this ruler is born. Then the rest of Yahweh's people will come back to Israel's family. That child will become the shepherd of his flock, the shepherd of his flock. He is going to lead them with Yahweh's strength because he is Yahweh. He'll have the same reputation as Yahweh, his God. Then his people will have an undisturbed life because all people on earth will learn how great he is. This man is going to be the reason they have peace. They're going to learn how great he is. See, Jesus' greatness doesn't come from his identity, from being God, yet stooping to do something beneath him and sharing a human life and a human body. But his greatness comes from what he volunteered to do in our place, devoting himself not to just laying on a beach somewhere on earth as a human, drinking daiquiris and having servants wait on him, but coming to earth to devote himself to what God demands of every human's life, which we are incapable of giving, which we don't want to give. And then suffering at the end, the full eternal punishment for every human sin and replacing those sins on humans with his holiness. That's what people on earth will learn about how great he is. And this is the reason the last line says, this man is going to give them peace. There's one final Bible section. It's from the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, almost to the end of the New Testament. This book you can see from the uh, slide was written maybe 30, 40, 50 years after uh, Jesus' mission was done. And you can see that it's written to Jewish people. That's why it gets the name Hebrews. These Jewish people had become part of God's family of believers. But when the Roman Empire started to threaten all followers of Jesus and say, you're dead meat. You're, you're, what you believe is unpatriotic. You won't worship the emperor or the Roman Empire as a god, which was mandatory around this time. And since you say that your person you're married to is your brother or sister, if you're married to a Christian, which is incest, since you eat a man named Jesus's body and drink his blood. And since you talk about this Jesus arrival on earth, that the, he came as a king, this is terrorism for the Roman Empire. They outlawed Christianity. And so many 
Jewish Christians said, mm, we can go back to being Jewish. This was a legal religion, grandfathered in. We Jewish people don't have to suffer any kind of punishment or persecution, discrimination, but Christians will. So this letter to the Hebrew Christians tells them Jesus is bigger and better than what the rules were in the Old Testament for Jewish people. Take a look at this important section where there's a quote from the Old Testament book of Psalms, Psalm 40, and the Bible says Jesus spoke this quote. Take a look. Start at verse 2. If these Jewish animal sacrifices could have cleared Jewish people's record once and for all, God would have let them stop bringing sacrifices because they already did the sacrifices and they got a clean record. They'd have a clear conscience. Their guilt would be gone. Instead, God ordered them to keep these sacrifices coming. This reminded them they still had sin guilt on their record. The, the deaths of bulls and goats cannot offset the wrongs people have done. And hang on to your hats. Here's Jesus' quote from a thousand years before his physical arrival, beginning his mission. Here's why, as Messiah came here to our world, he told God animal sacrifices and offerings won't do the tr trick. So you prepared a body for me to offer. Burning up a whole animal as a sacrifice doesn't delete human sins. That's the reason I volunteered punish me instead. It's in writing about me in the book of God's word. So here it's Jesus in the Old Testament Bible quoting other Old Testament Bible sources and saying, they were all talking about me too. I have come to take everyone's place, my God. So if this isn't relevant, I don't know what is. This speaks to you and me directly from Jesus saying, you have someone who knows, who cares, and who promised to fix it all. Verse eight, in this Bible section, Messiah first said burning up a whole animal as a sacrifice doesn't delete human sins. They won't do the trick. These sacrifices are what God required in the Bible. Then Messiah volunteers, I have come to take everyone's place. So, God did away with all the old sacrifices and put the sacrifice of Messiah in their place. We are now holy and clean because Jesus, Messiah, did what God planned by sacrificing his body once to rid us of all sin. This is really good news. But it says we are now holy and clean. It doesn't mean in our personal lives, but it means in our rec in God's record book under our names, He has us down as holy and clean because we share the identity of God the Son as a human being on earth at the end of His record keeping time. So this is pretty important. There are places in the world, I think there are places in Asia where they dress up the Christmas tree to look like Godzilla. And Godzilla, you remember, is that dragon that comes out of the ocean in Japan and causes all sorts of devastation, destruction, despair. And some people think, no, it's kind of fun to imagine Godzilla as what the Christmas tree looks like. 
we can celebrate Godzilla as one of the things that made the country of Japan great. And maybe that's something to celebrate during this time of year, the arrival of Godzilla. Yeah, there's plenty of other kind of superheroes too that we could make Christmas be all about. Not just Godzilla, but there's King Kong, right? They shoot at him with their guns and nothing hurts him. He stands high atop the Empire State Building or the top of the Christmas tree. And he rescues the girl who otherwise is going to get hurt. There's all kinds of superheroes that are out there for people to ooh and ah at. But the Bible says that Jesus is the superhero. He is dressed up in a God body. He's not just a human, but he is 100% the only real God himself. In the flesh, which God does not have by nature, he is a spirit. And so this is why what's in that little bed in a barn is more than what appears to the eye. He's not Jesus. He's not just playing dress up. It's not a costume that he wears, but it is an entirely new identity for him as God. The Bible tells us that Jesus, since he went back to heaven, has not stopped being a human. It wasn't something that he could just, you know, change out of his human uniform to go back to having his God existence that he had for all eternity. No, this is his permanent getup. It is his actual existence now for all time even when you and I meet him face to face, we're going to see that he is still human and he is still the only real creator and judge of all people. And like we said, this is a mind-blowing new identity, even for him. You can hear it in this section we have in Psalm 40 that's stuck right in the middle of the Hebrew section. Animal sacrifices and offerings won't do the trick. You prepared a body for me to offer. You can almost hear the awesomeness in the way that Jesus says this in Psalm 40, which was, remember, put in writing for Jewish people to sing as part of their hymns and songs, put to music, and they'd be able to sing this. And so remember it better that God prepared a body for this rescuer, this Jewish guy who's going to rescue humanity, have the greatest impact of all time. Burning up a whole animal as a sacrifice doesn't delete human sins. And that's the reason I volunteered, Jesus says, punish me instead. I have come to take everyone's place, my God. He wasn't telling God something new. He wasn't coming up with a plan that God had never thought of, Jesus is God. And so this plan had always existed. And once God made hum humanity, and once humanity sinned, then God could unveil it bit by bit to a stunned world of people who would not be able, who would struggle to believe how amazing this news is. Humans do not notice as he personally supervises their lives. And uh, sometimes we think it's not even possible. This is a mind-blowing new life form. Being a God, the God, and 
human at the same time. We've talked about this. We said the human beings are one sort of race. There are not many races on the earth. There's one race, and that is human beings. Even on people that have different color skin, you can look at their hands and see that they have the same inside their hands as the same color as, as everybody else does. Humans are one race. Angels are a second kind of race. They did not always exist until God created them sometime in the first six days of creation. But when they did exist, they did not exist as humans do. Humans have a body that you can see and the, an, the thing that animates them, that makes them alive, which is the soul that is inside each one of us, our actual personality, the thing that makes us who we are, that make, the thing that makes our body alive. Angels have a personality, but they do not have a body. And God enables them to do any of the supernatural things he commands them to do. So they are a different race than human beings are, angels. God is a third kind of race or life form. He has always existed without a body. He has always existed as the one, the all-powerful, who can and did do everything. And this is the one who, in this highest form of life, this highest life form, made himself, skipped the angel life form. He didn't choose to do that, even though that would have been better for him. Became a human, which would be the more degrading form of human, of, of life. When we talk about the Hulk, you can imagine this might be one option for how God would show up if he comes as an incredibly gigantic form of human being. This will get everybody's attention, and then they'll be able to listen and learn what God wants them to know. This is not the way God chose to come to earth in this form of human body. He did not come to earth as Superman, dressed up like a mild-mannered, meek newspaper reporter, Clark Kent. But then when there was trouble, then he could transform himself into Superman and do all kinds of amazing things. This is this was another viable way that God could have come, but he did not come this way. And he has his reasons for it. Spider-Man is uh, a superhero that is more along our lines. He isn't the imposing physical specimen that some of the other superheroes are, but he can do amazing things. This is not the format that Jesus showed up in either. The way that he chose to come is in the weakest form and, and never showed any of his supernatural capabilities or identity. He came as a human being in the normal form that human beings come in, weak, helpless, incapable baby. This is, this is the part that's so inconceivable that we heard about in our first Bible reading for today, where Elizabeth says, you're the mother of my God. Wow. This is, would only be believable if God works in us to make us believe this amazing stuff. When Jesus walks by, angels salute because he's their creator. And they've never had a complaint against him yet. In fact, they're amazed by this new life form that God himself takes on without diminishing anything about himself. Angels are in shock as they announce to humans what God has done in the beginning of God's existence as a human. They can't understand it. This is no fable. He's the one 
who brings peace on earth by his life and death. We know why both of those two parts are so important. His lifetime in our place is what earned us our ticket and our identity as holy saints and his damnation death on the cross is still something that we struggle to grasp. This is the way that he took our punishment so that God has no form of justice against us at all. So don't let his appearance fool you when you see him. He is serious. Even as a baby, he's got determination. He's on a mission. He is going to make it happen. Nothing is going to stop him. Even at this age, he is thinking about you personally. He can do that because he didn't block some of the things out. Remember, as a human, Jesus didn't do anything supernatural until he was 30 years old. But he still knew what God wanted. He knew what he was here for. As God, he knows about you and me and the hopeless situation we put ourselves in. And that's the reason he's determined. Because he, even 2,000 years ago, way before that even, cared about you or me. For what reason we struggle to put into words. He's going to change everything for all mankind. And this is really important. This is what we latch on to as sinners for our future. So a good thing to take away from all this is that when you realize who he is, then you understand why he came. If you don't realize who he is, then you're going to misunderstand what mission he is on. star that'll guide Chris Kringle to your chimney. Good move, my man. Oh, uh, no, it's the uh, star, star of Bethlehem. Right, yeah. Bethlehem, North Pole. Same thing, right? Ugh. Nope. Uh, no. Uh, uh, sorry. It's the uh, the star that, you know, the Magi. Right. Magi. What is the Magi? found something on the web about emojis Check it uh, out. the magi the uh the wise man who came to see the messiah the, the christ the uh son of god uh, Then he would grow up to become Santa. No, no, no. He's going to grow up and he's going to pay for the sins of the world. I guess that'd be a pretty hefty price tag, huh? Yeah. That's why it's called Christmas Christ. -mas. Well, I wish you would have told me all this before I sent my Christmas bonus and all that junk over there. Thanks a lot. Merry Christmas. Hey, I... <laughs> you look like my Santa. <laughs> Let's close with a prayer. Father, thank you for disregarding our ignorance, our stubbornness, 
our intentions to do evil. We thank you for not ignoring them, but punishing them on our substitute, our brother, Jesus, our rescuer and our God. Help this stick in our heads. Help us depend on this treasure, this always. Help us live for you. In Jesus' name we ask this. Now receive and believe the blessing of the Lord himself. It comes courtesy of Jesus, life on earth in our place, and his death and damnation at the cross for us. The Lord's blessing you all the time and protecting you constantly too. The Lord's making his face smile on you and he's being gracious to you, the opposite of what we all deserve. The Lord's looking on you, paying attention to you with his favor, and he's giving you constantly his peace. And so that's it for this week. Uh, for today, at least, uh, Friday is Christmas Eve. And that's the day we will have an in-person service at four in the afternoon. Uh, the next day is Christmas Day. There won't be anything. The day after that, Sunday, is when we'll have a Zoom service at our normal time. Uh, eight o'clock. And then Monday night, there's an in-person opportunity for the same uh, worship stuff, the same Bible sections. So God's blessings on <clears throat> your week and uh, Merry Christmas to you as well.